Hey, what's up everyone, it's Hokoff Pop Term Wrestling back with another banger. This week, we'll actually be covering 10 wrestlers on Top 10 Wrestling. I know, right? These are the 10 biggest hotties in TNA wrestling history. And talking of history, I'll try to throw some of that in there for you too. Let me know in the comments who would be in your top three. Please also make sure you subscribe because I've checked my stats and only 3% of people who watch my videos are actually subscribed. Enough words. It's not going very well. I would talk on for a few more minutes about why you should subscribe, but instead, we don't have time for that because we've got 10 wrestlers to talk about. So let's get into the video. Number 10, Maria. She was most famous for her fairly long stay at the WWE where she played a ditzy diva. She came through diva search and she definitely lived up to the stereotype of the type of woman they were hiring back then. Maria signed for TNA as the company was on a downward slope. At this point, it was mainly the hardcore fans left and they couldn't stand Maria because they were all about wrestling quality and not entertainment. TNA did the right thing though and didn't have a wrestle much, but I personally enjoyed everything she did. In TNA, she was no longer ditzy and instead she was this intense high maintenance woman. She managed her husband, the miracle Mike Bennett, doing his ring entrance announcing, but more importantly, she did the lady squad, which was her, Chelsea Green, Sienna and Ali. They mostly bullied Ali and it led to some really entertaining stuff. I miss the lady squad. She also captured the knockouts title, which people regard as a very low point in the division. The way I see it is, you want to feature your stars, and at the time she was the most famous woman's wrestler who could hold the belt. It didn't last that long anyway, so I personally didn't see a problem with it. When Maria was on TV it was always interesting, and she cut some amazing promos. Number 9, Bella Donna. The Hawk is a man of the people, and for those people I want to supply some variety. Not everyone has the same taste in women, so this one is for you guys, the alternative lifestyle type people. Bella Donna was basically this goth chick who was hotter than Daphne. She had legs for days, or maybe she was just more willing to show them off. It's clouded my judgement. Either way, Bella Donna wasn't in TNA for very long. She was a member of Father James Mitchell's New Church faction. Apparently, she was extremely enthusiastic about everything wrestling, willing to do anything. This mostly involved her wearing skimpy outfits being smacked around the ring by the male wrestlers. The cameramen were complete pervs for her too. She was one of the original TNA knockouts and if she'd stuck around, she had all the tools to go far in the business. TNA just didn't have a woman's division at the time and they just stopped booking her. Roxanne passed away in 2019 at the age of 40 from unknown causes. She had a really unique look, in a good way. Number 8, Gail Kim. Gail Kim is a TNA legend who's had a few separate spells with the company. She was forced to do the typical diva stuff at first as these were the times, but she managed to break through from that and shift the focus onto the in-ring product. She deserves a lot of credit for this shift. Despite that, TNA still featured her as eye candy a lot of times. She described her divas matches in the WWE as traumatising, but then she also did countless photo shoots and later posted a video with her husband. She came off as a bit of a hypocrite. And that really is my only gripe about her time in TNA where she was a legend. Her whiny personality sometimes killed her image. I'll end on this though. During Gail Kim's first WWE run in 2003, she was harassed by fan emails wanting to tickle her feet. Simps have been around for much longer than we realised. But it did have a positive. Gail Kim would go on to naming her finishing manoeuvre, Eat Defeat, in honour of these fan stalkers. Number 7, Rebel. Despite doing very little in TNA, Rebel was incredibly popular with the live crowds. Most of what she involved with failed, but that wasn't actually her fault. She was a member of the Dollhouse. Failed. She was a member of the Menagerie. Failed. She broke her arm. Failed. Unlike others on this list, TNA didn't try to keep her out of the ring and it unfortunately led to a few dodgy matches. But she could do the splits on the ropes, which was really cool. She often got chance of You Are Sexy from the live crowd. We can have her if we want it. Yeah. She's actually signed to AEW right now, which I find bizarre. She's 44 years old. What's she been doing for the company? Someone tell me, please, because that's astounding to me. Anyway, she's a very pretty lady. Good for her. Crazy Steve and the Freak. No, 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 no. We're not Crazy Steve. He's crazy. And the Freak, absolutely freaking not. No. Listen. Number six, Raka Khan. Personally, I'd rank her higher. I found this woman to be a real catch, but I'm trying to base this on general consensus. Raka Khan is extremely attractive, if you just completely ignore her personality, which is extremely ugly. She pretty much sucked in the ring too, this isn't going well. Just watch 5 second highlights and you'll be okay. She was Scott Steiner's freak and then one of Awesome Kong's minions. 
She didn't last long in TNA at all. She was dating Perk Angle at the time and they had a very violent relationship. Reportedly, she refused to leave his house and she's had all sorts of legal problems since. She's actually been in the wrestling news lately too because she's bonkers. She's awaiting trial over child custody stuff. She also tried to sue pretty much everyone who has ever wrestled. She made claims such as The Rock tried to kidnap her. Honestly, it's hilarious. The case was unsurprisingly thrown out of court the other day. Number 5, Taryn Terrell. The Hawk isn't the biggest fan of Tiffany. I'm not sure why, but I can respect that most of you probably find this woman to be extremely attractive. She had the typical blonde Barbie look, which I'm sure the WWE were infatuated with at the time. When her time in WWE came to an end, she jumped to TNA. She spent a large portion of time refereeing women's matches where she was very distracting. She eventually feuded with Gail Kim and it turned out she did know how to wrestle after all. Unfortunately, she kind of cruised by on the reputation she had gained since her brilliant matches with Gail Kim. She didn't do a lot else in the brilliant department. She formed her own faction, the Dollhouse, and never really understood what that was supposed to be. Some weeks they'd be acting sexy and other weeks they'd be acting like little babies. I don't get it. Number 4. Rosie Lotta Love. No, I'm kidding, it's Sarita. Sarita in TNA is a really weird one. It almost felt like the knockout's booking was changed on a weekly basis when Sarita was in TNA. Sometimes they'd want her to be a luchador, and she did quite well at that as she teamed with Taylor Wilde to capture the tag belts. But then other weeks it felt like TNA wanted her to be a diva, and she'd go around calling all the other women skanks and whores. When her storyline cousin Rosita, who is Thea Trinidad, joined TNA, Sarita turned heel. They did a Mexican-American faction, and as annoying as that was, Sarita seemed to be looking better with each show. I almost forgot about the moron surrounding her. I don't know if it was the fact that she was playing a bad girl. Look, I don't know, but Sarita had a nice natural look and hips that don't lie. She managed to be quite different to the other girls on the roster without going too far. She's also one of the few people who the Hawk can still find attractive wearing a mask, so you know she must be a looker. Number 3, Scarlet Bordeaux. Shut up, Five. A ten is talking. Oh my god. Scarlet is the only recent inclusion, if you can call 2019 recent. Scarlet is obviously a very attractive lady, which would have mass appeal. You just need to Google the dance she gave Steiner to see that the video received 2.8 million views. Sex sells, but then again, that might be the Scott Steiner effect. She mostly just hung around with jobbers and impact, doing nothing important. Honestly, she felt like a complete waste there. She actually had a five-year stay of RRH before this, and she had brown hair, almost like a different person. Anyway, in Impact, her name was The Smoke Show, and one of her only matches was a victory over the gifted Glenn Gilberti. How is he gifted? I'm not sure if it was an issue of money, but Impact just didn't feature her regularly enough. And anyway, I can't unsee how she looked under that WWE lighting. Not a good look for her. But we'll give her a pass, because under certain lights, my beak is orange. Nobody's perfect, are they? Number two, Velvet Sky. A lot of you might have been expecting her to be number one, and I get that, one and two are pretty much interchangeable. Velvet Sky pretty much epitomizes the statement that sex sells, something that a number one fan Vince Russo would agree with. She played the bitchy mean girl personality as part of the beautiful people for the majority of her TNA run. Despite not being very exciting in the ring, fans were always excited to see her. It was probably mostly down to her entrance. Surprisingly, she wasn't featured in many diva gimmick type matches and instead most of her work was done in backstage promos and her entrance. My only small gripe with Velvet was that after doing all of this, she turned face and tried to act like bullying was wrong, even though one of her main character attributes in the past was bullying and hazing the other knockouts. Don't you just hate a hypocrite? Now before we get into number one, I just want to list a couple of honourable mentions who won't quite make the cut. Mickey James, although the Hawk is a country boy, the whole cowgirl thing doesn't do it for the Hawk. Chelsea Green and also Lacey Von Erich. I've honestly talked so much about Lacey, but there isn't much more to say, but I'd understand if you want to put her in your top three, but just not for me. And number one is Brooke Tessmarker. Probably the choice for the common man. I think she represents what is stereotypically considered good looking in this day and age. Brooke first came onto TV screens in 2007 as part of the WWE ECW brand, where she had a dance group called Extreme Expose with Kelly Kelly and Layla. WWE released her less than a year later. It was said to be because of her backstage incidents involving Melina. It must have been pretty bad because WWE was so focused on how women looked at the time and yet they still released her. So off to TNA she went in 2010. Brooke Tessmarker started out as the leader of the Grey Crew Eric Bischoff's assistant. She was highly sexualized from the start as it was insinuated that he only hired her to take care of his needs. Then she went and slept with Sting, Nash and the Pope. 
She was fired as his assistant and forced to become a wrestler, which was somehow made out to be worse than her last job. Her TNA in ring career was a slow start and pretty limited. They eventually teamed up with Tara, which was a team whose gimmick was that they were lesbians. Tara and Brooke called this team TNT for Tara and Tess Marker. For some reason, TNA didn't seem to want to market this team and they were never called by their name. They even went as far as drawing their own dodgy shirts. Not sure why this was. You'd think that team could be money if they put something behind it. They won the knockouts belts. It was fine. She also won the knockout single title three times. Her entrances were provocative and it felt like she had received coaching from Velvet Sky because they shared similarities. She was improving in the ring, but I can't remember a single match that stood out. The crowd were always on her side and she looked like a star that TNA management wanted to feature on TV. So that's why she was pushed so heavily. In 2013, she had a main storyline in TNA. Bully Ray, the leader of the Heel Aces and Eights, divorced Brooke Hogan and revealed that Brooke Testmarker was actually the Brooke for him. TNA suddenly realised that she had a very big asset, to pardon the pun, and they made sure to feature it as much as possible. It pretty much became her gimmick. Her finisher was the stink face. Despite her being a supposed heel with the Aces and Eights, she didn't do anything and the crowd didn't boo her. This should have been more, but TNA seemingly didn't want to pull the trigger. She also had a feud with her real life partner at the time, Robbie E. This wasn't exactly a high point and somehow made her feel less attractive. She had time for one more knockouts title win and then she called time on her career as she was going to be a mum. I'm actually surprised TNA didn't do more of her and feature her often. After all, Velvet Sky was aging by 2013 and Brooke seemed like a ready-made replacement. Although she was featured on the show, she was never featured in the way that beautiful people had been at the height of TNA's popularity. And that's the video guys, thanks for watching Bottom 10 Wrestling. Let me know who you think should have made the list, and who shouldn't. If you don't tell me, I won't ever be able to know, and it will play on my mind for days. Now I'm off to take your girl out for a Thatcher's Haze.